Hi, Jeremy Blake interviewing Simon Crow today. And Simon is an old friend of mine, and we've known each other for some 20 years. We were English language teachers in our youth, and we met at a college in Oxford. And Simon is now a leadership coach. He's a coach. He's all sorts of things, some of which we'll touch on today. And the purpose of this conversation is to help anyone who's either leading a team, managing a team, running an organization, to look at the role of partnering with somebody like Simon, or to also look at the role of coaching in your organization. So let's see what we discover. Um, Sai, uh, coming up to the barbecue season, there's beautiful sunshine today, and I was talking about this with a friend, that we get to meet people for the first time. Uh, we all come out of hibernation in the UK and we slowly start to emerge from the cold. And this is where we might have drinks or meet some people. And our lives generally get a bit more outdoors and social. So what do you do when you meet somebody new and they say to you, so what do you do? How do you try to answer that question? Well, my, my first instinct is to ask the question back because that's what coaches spend most of their time doing. But what I try to describe my work as is working in partnership with people. So I work with, with partners uh, or partner with people who are trying to create something. It's normally around creating a change, some impact in some way. So perhaps they're trying to create a, a, a change in, in the performance of their team or they're trying to create uh, a new business opportunity um, or they're trying to, to, to create some new skills or a new mindset around something. So I work in a creative partnership with these people, excuse me, <clears throat> in trying to create a pathway to achieving whatever their objective is. That's um, great. Yeah, and the tool I use for that is coaching. But if I say to somebody, I'm a coach, mm -hmm. some people either look for my tracksuit um, or, yeah. or say, the, as, the bu as the bus parked up outside. So people have always got their own ideas of what coaches <laughs> are and what they do. So the word coaching... Um, it can sometimes be as be unhelpful as well as helpful. So I try to describe what I do as as helping people to to create and to achieve incredible things. So once once you've done that and people have kind of taken that in, what's the next typical thing they ask about projects and clients? Do they get very specific, or are most people happy with your first response? Well. What, what inevitably happens is I then start telling stories about people that I've worked with. So actually right. trying to help people understand within the context of an organisation or context of their own business, how working with me, um, you know, the impact of that and, and what it is they're able to create. So um, I might ask them, well, tell me a little bit about your business or tell me about your job or your job role or, or what's happening for you um, currently at work. Um, and they'll give me an example and I'll possibly be able to call on some experience that I had with a, with a previous mm. client and say, you know, I understand that. I was, you know, I did some work with somebody recently and we worked on this and the outcome was that. And just try to, to, to I suppose, give an example of the process by telling stories about people that I've worked with. Great. No, that's super. When we're often called in to sort out management or our managers need developing, we've got all of these teams and uh, we've got underperformance and, you know, we introduce coaching elements to the work, coaching elements to the leadership. And there's still uh, a mindset difficulty in how the company is going to change its results. So we know that if you talk about numbers all the time, you're not really working. You're talking about numbers, how you're going to hit numbers. So what I'm interested in is how can organizations that perhaps are, you know, ambitious or they're growing to a certain capacity, how can they take advantage of all that coaching gives to offer them? How can we, how can they slowly begin to see the advantage? Because it's still not widespread. So if you're talking about organizations as they go into the kind of go into the future, um, mm. really able to see new opportunities, to see to seize those opportunities, to be flexible organizations which yeah. are able to to operate uh, in new markets. Um, what I think you're talking about is creating a culture of, of leaders within the yeah. organization and really helping yeah. people yeah, who work within leadership, but also people who don't have leader it, like in their in their job title, how they can take greater self responsibility, how they can really step up, step up into a leadership role, um, because to me the the key for any of those things that we've talked about is the capacity for people to be flexible, 
to identify where their own development needs are, to know how to source the training or the learning that they need in order to develop new skills. Um, and so they can then start to, you know, to start to create a, a flexible, more responsive, um, more proactive type of, of workforce. Um, yeah. and, and coaching really focuses on that. Coaching is a, is a process whereby um, you give people greater self-awareness so giving them feedback or, or reflecting back to them the things that you hear them say or the things that you don't mm. hear them say often, to, to raise that level of self-awareness and then to help them to, to, um, to work out, to figure for, out for themselves a process by which they're going to obtain or attain the skills, the mindset, the shifts that they need in order to create the things that they're hoping to create. Yeah, no, I think... When I think about uh, the organizations that are doing well and the new types of organizations, it, it's, le it's less about your function and, and breaking down all these silos, you know, marketing, HR, um, production, you know, all, all the different silos and trying to get a, a group of leaders that are much better at communicating to each other. And I think you've said a lot more flexible in their approach, perhaps a lot more creative into how they look at the different routes to, to improve their business. Mm. Um, so what do you think are these core differences then between coaching someone to a different result and managing someone to a different result? So I think it depends on, on the organisation. It depends on the job role. It depends on the person. Because I, I, I never believe that, that one approach to leadership or management is the correct approach. To me, it's very situational. Mm -hmm. So if you're managing somebody who is very new into a job role, perhaps new into an organisation, they're going to need greater degrees of support. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that management is really useful there. So a much more sort of directive form of management where you're, where you're giving people information and skills as they need them. But clearly as people stay in roles and they become uh, more expert in those roles, they're going to want... Uh, a, a different approach in terms of leadership and management. They're going to be want. They're going to want more space in which they can try things. So they mm. want to become more autonomous. Yes. And so the role of the of the manager then becomes much more about um, supporting and empowering the individual. So, um, how I see it is is, you know, we can start to to use a coaching approach quite early on. But surely the person needs to have the basis on which they can, mm -hmm. they can, you know, they can approach the role. Do they, yeah. yeah, they need to know those basics. But really, as, you know, as, as we watch the person grow and develop, perhaps as a leader we want to step back a little bit, yeah. give them greater space, uh, encourage them, um, give them the opportunity to make mistakes, because you can't learn anything without making mistakes. Um, mm looking for things that you could perhaps um, delegate to the individual. So yeah. looking at how you can give them greater responsibility. And then as the manager stepping back and serving them rather than directing them. Yeah. So it becomes much more of a supporting role. And I think that's one of the great uh, benefits of a coaching approach is that yeah. you, you maintain that engagement with the individual so they know that they, you're there and you'll, su you'll support and they can trust you. Um, but what you're doing is you're giving them the space, I think, in which they can start to really express themselves. Um, and that's where I think you get, you know, you really start to get value out of our teams is when the mm. individuals are taking, you know, taking the, the responsibility to identify uh, new opportunities, um, looking at the skills they need in order to do those, op to, to, you know, to seize those opportunities. And you as the coach I supporting that. I work with a lot of companies that still have various things in place that they believe are, if you like, the steps. So succession planning, a lot of our retailers talk about this. And when I question them on it, it's very much finding someone else who can replace me and do everything I've done up to this point. And almost like the handing of keys, the handing of systems, the handing of knowledge, but not necessarily bringing in somebody new with ideas to, to replace their ideas or, or build upon their ideas. Um, now, one of the other facts is we're having an interview over, over Skype and we're recording it, we're using technology. You can work with a web designer in the Philippines. You can 
uh, get somebody to help you in, in, in a consultancy part who lives in the United States if you live in Russia. It doesn't matter. We live in this extraordinary global com um, global world. I can't remember what word I was thinking of. So how do we balance this uh, advancing technology to still try to develop people continually almost more in a remote fashion? Have you got some of the ideas or can you share with us some of the ways that you try to do this? Because I know you've got a lot of international clients. Um, how you try to still deliver a great service, uh, a great level of coaching ability with the very fact that you can't always sit next to your people? Well, I think the fact that we're having this conversation shows that the mm. technology is there and shows that the technology is, is um, you know, en enables this kind of relationship. So it doesn't really come down to me. It doesn't really come down to the fact that you're at distance because there's always the opportunity to make time to sit face to face over a Skype call or whatever. Again, it's about how you create the relationship. So it may be that you spend some time face to face with the person creating that relationship, creating that deep trust that often a coaching relationship you know, requires. Mm. Um, but it's a, to me, it's about creating a structure uh, in which there is regular contact. So. Yeah. You know, I'm always aware of what's going on in your life. I'm always aware of some of the challenges that you're facing at work. I'm always aware of the relationships and where they stand within, uh, you know, stand for you within your organisation. So that when I have conversations with you over Skype or over the telephone, um, it's, it's, there's not so much catching up, but I can start right. to get right into the language that you're using around creating rather than simply describing what's happening. Because that, to me, is where, where the person starts to learn and develop is when you can start to get them in their thinking into a new space where they're looking at how they can create solutions for the problems that they're, that they're facing or the challenges that they're facing, um, rather than simply just sort of recounting what's going on, describing the drama and the detail of their problems, but getting them much more into that focus and, and planning space. Because a, a lot of companies um, rely on telephones to... Develop, d deliver reports, have catch-ups, have conference calls. And I've had to be part of some of these things and people are pulled over in laybys or they're still driving. And there's not really a relationship taking place, not really an exchange of ideas. It's, it's an old-fashioned reporting culture, which I also feel, I don't know if you do, that you know, technology allows us to send a report. We don't necessarily need to verbalize a report and so I think this is another challenge for a lot of companies that are still in a maybe there's less trust around this that they require a physical report a physical update but I don't think it's always about what you're talking about which is adding creativity and energy to a relationship um, that's more of an observation I think rather than asking you a question on that but, um, but just to, to that point because one of the things yeah. that I've that I've noticed is often when people leave, sorry, move into, into management, a management role, um, they often think that the, their role is just to continue what they were doing before, yeah. but do something, you know, something additional, um, do some management, do some leadership in addition to what they're previously doing. And, and I think that the sooner people realise that moving into leadership is doing different things, Mm. not just doing the same things with a little bit more. Um, yeah. So to me, creating relationships with the people that I manage is my key role. Yeah. It's not something I do, you know, when I, when I get five minutes at the end of not the day. Not in addition. Yeah. yeah. And so the idea of, you know, pulling into laybys and stuff, it's, mm. it's, you've, got to, you've got to create an opportunity. And, and create for, and more time for this. It's not a tick box exercise. Um, and if I think of the clients where we have brought you in and, and we, we do leadership and coaching, it's they allow time for this to grow. They allow time for it to emerge. Um, and there's a lot more trust involved. Because you asked me at the beginning, how do, you know, how do we create organisations which are fit for the next decade, the yeah. next, next century? Um, to me, it's not about doing the same things. It's about doing something different. You know, mm. What got you here... It's exactly what's going to stop you getting to the next level. Yeah, because you've, you've reached. Yeah. So 
it, you know, so if it feels uncomfortable and people think, well, I couldn't do that within my, my, within my current role, my organisation wouldn't support that uh, within my, you know, wouldn't support that, that opportunity. They wouldn't give me time and space to do that. Yeah. Well, in a sense, what you're doing is you're limiting the, the capacity of the organisation to, to make itself ready for the next step. Yeah. You know, it's, we talk about people changing, but the organisation has to support that change. It has to be a cultural change. Yeah. Because if you send somebody on a, on a coaching program or get them to work with a coach and they start getting these great new ideas and becoming really independent thinkers, but the organisation actually isn't ready for that, wants to close them down, keep them yeah. in a box, then what you'll find is the person will outgrow the organisation quite quickly. Absolutely. And they'll often move on. So, you know, coaching we, comes... We do have a pretty fluid um, job market. You know, people don't have jobs for life. People move a lot more. It used to always be three years. Increasingly, it's 18 months. Um, and as you're saying, as I haven't really considered it, a lot of the reason for movement is perhaps they are restricted. Um, and they seek seek something different. Um, okay, Cy. Si, um, I'm interested now in, in a few first steps to take tips because people who might be uh, tuning into this are thinking, okay, coaching, I'm a leader, I'm running this team, I've got certain people who are wonderful, I've got others who are a real challenge. You know, what are some of the good first steps to take to try as a leader, either of an organization or of a team, uh, to take, to, to, to experiment down a more uh, creative coaching path, whether that's materials you're suggesting or behaviors you're suggesting. If you could talk around that for a minute. I'm not really into this coaching thing, but this sounds interesting. What are some of the first steps I could take? So for me, the first take first step is to take the choice and I mean by that that just because you're, you've got leader in your job title or someone's made you a manager and now you've got some leadership responsibilities it's about making the choice to be a leader and that means realizing that you've got to start doing things in a different way you've got to approach the role with a different mindset with a leadership mindset because because being a leader is about getting work done through other people Mm -hmm. rather than it just being your own uh, you know the, the uh, your out, your own contribution and the output from that so it's about a shift in mindset and i think it's a really good idea also to get some some coaching skills because mm -hmm. you know it's it's uh, it's great to come with the right approach but it's always useful to have, to have some basic coaching tools to use and the the primary one for me is is creating the ability to listen yeah. So that creates about creating space and time and trust with the, with the people that you lead so you can sit down and listen to them. Because what we're really trying to do, again, as coaches is to improve the quality of people's thinking. And the way that we can do that is to give them the time and space to think. And then you use our questioning um, to, I suppose, to, to, to stretch their perception, to stretch their awareness, to... Um, to perhaps feed in things that they've not considered, but really it's about, it's about supporting their thinking rather than just giving the answers, because by, by giving the answers, there isn't the creative process, the brain isn't given the opportunity to problem solve, it's just receiving information. Um, so um, that's, that, would, that would be my, my first, uh, the first steps into coaching is first of all, make the decision that that's what you're going to do, commit to, to getting some of the skills, um, and then spend time uh, listening, create space and time to, to really develop relationships with the people that you're leading. Can you, um, as we come to a close, give an example of a, a breakthrough that you're particularly energised about that perhaps happened recently or a few times ago in your coaching career? And of course, we don't need to know these names, but is, is there something that um, you're happy to share with us, um, an experience you've been involved in where it, it's been thoroughly rewarding to have helped this per person to, to make considerable change? I mean, it's often, you know, often the, the, I talked about the coaching partnership. Um, it can deliver incredible things, but often it's accumulation of lots of, of small insights mm, okay. um, and really helping the person to, to, you know, to kind of train themselves into a much more sort of problem solving type mindset. 
Um, so people are really sort of stepping up, if you like, to that leadership challenge. And a really simple example that just happened very recently um, was just noticing that whenever I was corresponding with a client of mine, every time they wrote an email to me to try and set, set up an appointment or whatever, the language they used was really um, uh, imprecise. It was, um, it, it was it lacked any kind of leadership. So it was like, we can have a meeting there if that's okay with you, but if not, then don't worry, you can always arrange to have it on another date, so whatever works for you, whatever. And I just wrote a very simple reply to this person saying, it seems to me that you, that you believe that being very flexible is a strength. And I just asked the question, is there another mm -hmm. way that it could be interpreted? And it changed the person's life. Mm. I mean, literally, because they suddenly realised in all of their... Um, interactions with people yeah. well not just not just their their correspondence but in any interaction mm. they were not showing any leadership at all and it was and it meant that 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 they were constantly trying to please or second guess what other people were looking for you know right. looking for them looking from them um, mm. and just to have that realization that actually what I need to do is to show up with a much clearer sense of what it is that I want what much clearer sense of of what value I can bring because that's ultimately why you're being paid. You're being paid to bring more of you, being paid to bring that's more of your own ideas. That's a great in how you've used a question. You haven't told them, you haven't judged them. You've used a question, but the question has cut through everything, really, and enabled them to, you know, And that moment of insight, mm. their thinking, their brain has now physically changed because it's created a new, a new neural pathway. Mm. So that's how coaching can really be powerful because it changes how mm. people think. And if, if, if we change how people think, that changes the world. Mm. Um, and so that to me is a, is a really great little example of the power of coaching. Great, Simon. Well, look, thanks for giving us your time today. Thank you very much to Simon Crow. And you've been listening to Jeremy Blake having a chat with him today. And hopefully, if you have been tuning in, you'll have got some insights, some ideas, and some inspiration of what you can do to bring coaching into your work. Thank you very much, Sai. Thanks, Jeremy. Take care. Catch Bye -bye. you soon. Bye.